brew pour. What is it, Dr. Wolfenstein? I need you to come over here and stir this. Oh, is this the artificial primordial slime you've created from which a human form will rise up and declare its existence with one terrifying groan? No, it's the gravy for the meatloaf. See if it needs more salt. The creation slime is over there in that vat. Should I stir that too? No. Can I ask you a question? I am a truly great mad scientist. I made a monkey that shoots lightning out of its eyes, a human baby with real bat wings, and and an army of poisonous robots that I sent to the moon. I thought it was Canada? We're splitting hairs. Come to mention it, I have split hairs. I did the first human centipede 11 years before the guy who got credit for it. I'm not sure what your question is, Dr. Wolfenstein. How come I don't get to do a TED Talk? Because they never asked you? Look at some of the crap they put up there. Amy Cuddy? Seriously. Look at my body language. Look at my power positions. Gag me with a rhino horn. Maybe you should talk to Guy Ross. Too late. He's in the meatloaf. Dr. Wolfenstein, I think something is happening in the slime. Yes, I've made life where there was no life. I've I've taken mere slime and, and caused it to animate. Soon, rising up from that viscous goo will be the most terrible and nauseating life form known to humans. Uh, Dave Matthews fan? Okay, second most terrible and nauseating life form known to humans. Set the kitchen timer for two hours. So long to wait. I've learned not to rush. Remember my human hot pocket creature? Very disappointing. I still think the problem was in the crisping sleeve. Anyway, while we wait, here's a radio show about slime. And now, the vice president for weeping sores at Goldman Sachs, Colin McEnroe. This is going to be a show about slime. Uh, Like several, maybe even many of our shows, uh, some of it grew out of the work of the conceptual artist uh, Jonathan Keats, who you'll hear later in the show. You'll also hear much later in the show the way slime has become kind of this weird internet phenomenon. There are sort of slime-related celebrities even on the internet. People like watching slime be made and do certain things. But we really have to begin with that idea that's probably embedded somewhere in your human race consciousness that we come from slime, right? When I started thinking about this, I started thinking about Kurt Vonnegut's book, A Cat Cradle, where there's a religious leader named uh, Bokanen and his last rites go like this. God made mud. God got lonesome. So God said to some of the mud, sit up. See all I've made, said God, the hills, the sea, the sky, the stars. And I was some of the mud that got to sit up and look around. Lucky me, lucky mud. I, mud, sat up and saw what a nice job God had done. So that's sort of in there somewhere, that mud, slime, something like that, that there was something that was inanimate and then it became animate, something that was not alive and then it became alive. It's very much in the idea the human race has about where it came from. And it turns out it's been a very persistent idea. Uh, Joining us right now is Darren LeHoux, professor in the Department of Classics and Department of Philosophy at Queen's University in Ontario, and the author of the new book, Creatures Born of Mud and Slime, The Wonder and Complexity of Spontaneous Generation. Welcome to our conversation. Many thanks. Let's begin there, this notion of spontaneous generation. Explain it as it's been understood across the centuries. We know that animals and plants reproduce, that animals mate with each other, plants have pollen that goes across to other plants and creates new plants that are the same or or new animals that are the same as the old animals. But for a long time, and actually a remarkably long time, we also believed that sometimes stuff that was just kind of fermenting and rotting would generate animals from itself. So just on the seashore, as the foam would wash up on the seashore and mix with the sand and mud, that that somehow created fish or eels or worms. And the idea that that kind of thing happened, spontaneous generation, that stuff would just spontaneously turn from being non-living matter into living matter, was incredibly persistent in the history of the sciences. And we only got rid of it a little over 100 years ago that we finally said, okay, that doesn't happen. But until after the work of Louis Pasteur, it seemed like that was something that was actually happening in the world. And I find that really remarkable. Well, in a way, it's remarkable. In a way, you can sort of understand how even once 
observable cycles uh, of reproduction could be detected and understood and observed, there would still be the question of, well, okay, so but what got all that started, right? I mean, there, there's always going to be that question of what became alive first, that there was a point in the history of the Earth where, where there was nothing alive on it, right? So how did it get started? I mean, is that, I mean, we can begin with Aristotle or wherever, but is that the first question they're trying to answer? For someone like Aristotle, that's not a question he needs to answer, because he thinks that the world has always existed more or less in the form that it's in now, and that species have always existed more or less in the form that they're in now. So he doesn't have a question of how that started. He just seems to think the world's always been there. When you get the beginnings of Christianity coming in, in the Roman period, then you have the issue of how animals and plants came to be, and the answer is given to you in the book of Genesis. God created the plants and animals, right? But when we start de-Christianifying our science by the 19th century, for sure, then someone like Charles Darwin has to think, where did life come from then if God didn't create it? How did it come into existence? And from there forward, we have to start thinking about what the mechanisms are, again, for turning non-living matter into living matter. What could possibly have done that? That is a difficult question to answer. We think we can sort of see it, but there is some debate about how exactly it happened. So let's go back to Aristotle for a second. Um, you know, you were describing that um, theory about a process by which fish are, are made. We have him to thank for that, right? I mean, he, there's even like a thing called a foam fish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the foam that washes up on the shore creates this thing called an aphros, which is the Greek word for foam, a foam fish. It's tricky because the thing with spontaneous generation is that a lot of people treat it as an idea that's just kind of simplistic, that if you didn't think about what's happening in your compost bin or what's happening in the meat that's rotting on the, well, I mean, rotting on the counter sounds daft, but anyway, you know the idea, Mm -hmm. that if you don't think too much about it, it just looks like it turns into maggots or it just looks like it turns into worms. And so it's a kind of simple idea. But the trouble is that People like Aristotle are thinking really hard about what life is. What does it mean for a thing to be living? And what exactly are the mechanisms that create that life? What is it that makes a new rabbit come into existence from its parents? Is that similar to the processes that create a maggot from my rotting garbage pile? Right. So Aristotle thought not unreasonably that maybe water was involved in heat? Yeah, and so for him, the mechanisms that produce life, he thinks that life is essentially something that has, quote-unquote, heat, even though insects we don't think of as being warm-blooded, but Aristotle thinks of them because they're alive as being hot in some sense. So he thinks heat has something to do with it, and for him, the definition of what it means to be living is that the animal or plant has a soul of some kind. In order to understand spontaneous generation and in order to understand animal reproduction and plant reproduction, he thinks of this thing called soul as kind of permeating all matter in the universe, that it just kind of has to be everywhere. And that's how he can explain the fish coming into existence on the shore as the water is washing up and creating foamy bubbles, that those bubbles contain souls in some way that in the heat of the sun then kind of encapsulate themselves in a membrane and turn into these fish or eels or whatever it might be. And I think, you know, a consistent pattern here that stretches across not just hundreds of years, but millennia is, you know, people observing something and just essentially drawing the wrong conclusion from it. So uh, by the 1200s, you've got Albertus Magnus, who's looking at fossils in rock. Uh, and so, look, there's a, there's a fish, there's a sneaky looking thing. And his conclusion is that probably they came from rock, right? <laughs> the rock yeah. made the snake, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that to me, it astounds me how different a world some of these folks lived in from the one I seem to live in, right? That, that they just saw the world so differently. And someone like Albertus, and Albertus is this, he's a really fascinating guy. He's, he's working in Paris and Cologne in the 13th century. He's in the first or second generation of Europeans who has access to 
translations of Aristotle. And so he's reading Aristotle voraciously. He's really trying to learn what the world is like by looking back at this ancient guy who seemed to know so much. And as he's doing that, he's thinking about stuff in his own experience. And so one of the things he has seen is these shells in stone. We would call them fossils, but he's seen them in Paris. And he's trying to think about what the mechanism might be for how they got created. And he just takes Aristotle's theory of spontaneous generation and uses that to explain how some fossils came into existence. And so he thinks that fossils in general, that often they come into existence by being spontaneously generated in the rock itself. They just pop into existence through the same forces that cause animals to be spontaneously generated. One of the problems or one of the reasons that people may uh, across millennia turn to the spontaneous generation idea is to reconcile biblical accounts with reality. So you get the biblical account of Noah's flood, which pretty much should have wiped out just about everybody except the people on the ark, except that the story kind of picks up you know, right after Noah's flood. There seem to be like people around. So yeah. one of the ways that medieval scholars, I guess, figured that out or, or explained that was once again, spontaneous generation. Yes. In the Latin Middle Ages, in Europe, there was actually a prohibition on believing that humans were spontaneously generated. But in the earlier Arabic tradition, Avicenna, who was this great Aristotelian commentator and, and, and a philosopher of some great merit in his own right, he couldn't quite understand how that many people got to populate the earth after this catastrophic flood. And so he figured that what must have happened was some people were spontaneously generated in the mud after the flood. And so the idea that even humans could be spontaneously generated was kicking around. And there are people who thought that, you know, once we discovered North America, once Columbus sailed across the sea and found these people over here, there were some people who thought that those folks, the Native Americans, had been spontaneously generated because they couldn't actually reconcile the biblical account of creation with an account that had people living over there. Right, and there's a politics to that, too. If these are uh, people oh, who's, who spontaneously generated up out of mud or slime or whatever, then, then they don't really necessarily have the same human status as their old-world counterparts. Do they have the same kind of soul, right? Do we have to treat them like we would treat other people in our community? And often the answer was no. I, I, I mean, I, I, and I, so the, I think we know how the answer came out, too. Nope, you can enslave them, you can slaughter them. Uh, they yeah. aren't quite the same as us. You know, there's still even among white supremacists a term mud people uh, for you know races that they consider inferior. I don't know if it goes back to a... I think I've seen that phrase. I hadn't thought to connect it, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so there is a really creepy politics to all this. Now, the other thing that's interesting about this, and you've alluded to it already, you sort of put Pasteur as the period at the end of this, uh, you know, millennia's long sentence, but this idea of spontaneous generation, that whether it's from mud or slime or the rotting carcass of a cow or whatever, that life can just spontaneously erupt from that. It actually didn't really stand up to scientific testing very well. It was pretty easy to knock down or disprove, but it just survived that, right? That there were repeated coroner's reports on this idea to say, oh, no, that's dead. We'll never say that again. And it just kept going. Yeah, it's funny. It actually turns out that it's quite hard to really really sterilize a solution, right? You can boil and boil and boil. One of the substances that gets used a lot is gravy because it happens to be quite rich and gets infested with microorganisms fairly quickly. So historically, people are boiling gravy to see if they can seal off the container and keep it from producing life. You and I think of sterilizing water. If you've ever traveled, you want to boil some water for tea, you boil it for 90 seconds or two minutes or three minutes, and you think that's good enough. But actually, it's not. So when you start trying to actually sterilize a substance and boil it and seal it off in a container so that no air can get in, so that you have a controlled experiment, really, you have to boil it, and then you have to let it cool and let any what we would think of as spores hatch and then you have to boil it again and let it cool and any spores that they made then you have to boil it again and so historically people are boiling substances for five minutes 10 minutes 90 minutes and still getting life in their flasks afterwards the question then is 
what have you done exactly to the gravy if you've boiled it for 90 minutes? Have you, one person says, well, I've killed off any eggs that might have been in there. And the other person says, well, no, you've destroyed the, what they call the vegetative force, the vegetable force, the power for life in the material. You can't really decide between those two explanations, except given the trajectory of history, right? We come out the other end and we now say, yeah, yeah, there were eggs or spores in there. But the people at the time are looking at these substances saying, what exactly is going on in the vial? It's hard to prove a negative. It's hard to prove that, you know, something isn't happening. And as you say, there's a, there might be a way to explain it that sort of it's sort of the logical fallacy of begging the question, right? Yeah. That, you know, the that you destroyed the thing that makes spontaneous generation happen by boiling the gravy. But that doesn't prove that spontaneous generation doesn't happen. It just means that when you do certain things to gravy, yeah. you don't get it anymore. Yeah. So that that is kind of begging the question. It does seem somehow as though if you sort of fast forward to comic books and science, I can't in science fiction and stuff, I can't even you know, identify all the times where there's, I've seen some kind of vat of slime or ooze or something like that, or a <laughs> pond, and suddenly this kind of face forms on it and gradually sitting up in this vat of slime or, or, or this pond of ooze or mud or something. There's like this humanoid thing that gets up and it stands up. This idea, I think, it may be scientifically disproven, but in our imaginations, I feel like it lives on. Sure. And I love the Kurt Vonnegut quote that you started the segment with. It's a beautiful piece. And in a sense, the idea behind spontaneous generation, that non-living matter can somehow assemble itself and become living things, it's a fascinating idea in itself, but it's also something that we have to accept happened once in the universe, at least, right? And may have happened many times. It's a curious thing about the origins of life on Earth that if you look at the history of the early Earth, you know, four and a half billion years ago, 4.2 billion years ago, 4 billion years ago, as it developed, it's not very long after we get oceans, like water, pooling into collections of water on the planet, on the surface of the planet. It's not very long after that that we get life. And, and life is very improbable, too. I mean, I, I know, to be. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's uh, like one model that's uh, brought up by by scientists saying that the, the probability of a of a cyclone uh, whirling over a junkyard and assembling uh, a 747 just by its force. It's that that level of improbability that life at all of any kind could be created anywhere. Anyway, we know the answer because Q from Star Trek, who's this kind of all knowing <laughs> meta being silver surfer type guy who just can go anywhere and, and know everything and is constantly bringing Captain Picard up to date on what's really happening in the universe. Q has explained it thusly. Come here. You see this? Right here. Life is about to form on this planet for the very first time. A group of amino acids are about to combine to form the first protein. The building blocks. <laughs> of what you call life. Everything you know, your entire civilization, it all begins right here in this little pond of goo. So we're back to goo and slime and mud. And I guess that's written into our minds also because... Even though we've got Albertus Magnus thinks you can do it right out of rock, and then there are other ideas about like cow corpses and stuff like that. There's something about the idea of a moldable substance that's somewhere between my, um, slime, mud, goo. That idea of viscosity or something it seems to be stuck in our heads as this place that life comes from. And as you say, something had to happen that had never happened before at least once, and maybe a lot of times. Yeah, and the building blocks. That you need. I mean, you heard it in the quote there, you know, amino acids that form proteins. Those aren't really simple chemicals, like the molecules that have to combine together to make proteins, to make uh, nucleic acids, to make lipids, which you need to make the walls of cells. Each of those requires different kinds of conditions. And the question now is, what were those conditions exactly? And a lot of scientists now are thinking that maybe it's these hydrothermal vents at the, you know, at the bottom of the ocean that, that are spewing out sulfuric hot liquid 
that that creates the conditions under which life might come to be, that we could have the chemical reactions happening there. And maybe in the pores of rocks or something, you know, that you can collect just enough of the right kinds of stuff that cells would form that can reproduce. And the question is, what's the process by which that happens? And I mean, another possibility, of course, is that it doesn't happen on a planet at all, that uh, if everything is stardust, uh, ultimately, yeah, you can pick it up from there. Well, it's just so fascinating, right, that one of the hypotheses, and it's, it's as plausible as anything else as far as I'm concerned, is that it comes from elsewhere, that water or meteorites or comets bringing water or meteorites or something hitting the Earth brought life to this planet rather than it having formed here in the first place. And we've sent tardigrades and other kinds of things out into space to see if they survive. And sure enough, (laughs) they can survive out in space for some time anyway. And maybe DNA or RNA can survive for quite some time in space. And so it's entirely possible that life formed on another planet and got brought to Earth by meteorites or got brought to Earth in water from comets. The most fascinating possibility that I've seen is uh, a guy called Avi Loeb at Harvard, who's an astrophysicist, realized that, you know, if you think about the average temperature of the universe right now, it's pretty darn cold, right? There are hot spots where there are suns and stars, but basically the average temperature of the universe is pretty darn cold right now, but it hasn't always been cold. After the Big Bang, 10, 11, 12 million years later, the average temperature of the universe was basically the temperature of the room you and I are sitting in right now. And maybe life just came into existence before we even had stars. There might have been just a a lot of it. Crazy. Like, it's it's really fascinating. We like crazy. And things are going to get uh, even crazier, I dare to say, in our second segment today. But right now we (laughs) want to thank Darren LaHue, professor in the Department of Classics and Department of Philosophy at Queen's University in Ontario, author of the new book, Creatures Born of Mud and Slime, The Wonder and Complexity of Spontaneous Generation. Thanks for doing this, sir. Many thanks. You know, when people ask me, Colin, why are you doing a show about slime? Well, actually, nobody has actually asked me that, but maybe somebody will. When they do, I, I want to just say before we even get going into the ne- this next segment uh, from the heart, um, because I feel so much of what I hear on public radio, what I see in the uh, processes of the world around me, it's so sapiens-centric. I, I mean, speaking as somebody who identifies as Neanderthal, I sort of feel like, oh, yeah, homo sapiens, you guys are so great. So, But let's be honest. I mean, life on Earth probably began about 3.5 billion years ago, probably for about a billion years Uh, like from maybe about 1.8 billion years ago to 800 million years ago, there was just a layer of slime, just a layer of slime. That's all, right? Uh, And what have we done? Because this is so like you, so like you Homo sapiens people. We owe so much to slime, but basically we have cut slime out of the decision-making process. They are no longer talked to they or it, depending on which pronoun it prefers. Um, they are no longer talked to about all kinds of important things, but we wouldn't be here if, if not for slime. So uh, fortunately, there are uh, visionaries out there. One of them is Jonathan Keats, with whom we have done many shows, conceptual artist and experimental philosopher from, from San Francisco, where else, uh, as well as secretary to, <laughs> to the secretary to the Plasmodium Consortium at Hampshire College. What is that, you may ask? Well, you would be, be helped in your inquiries by Megan Dobro, assistant professor of biology at Hampshire College and scientific attaché to the Plasmodium Consortium. All right. Well, that hasn't explained it any better, but they're both here. And so, Jonathan, uh, maybe you can build a little bit on some of my observations, right? Some of this project you're involved in right now is to get slime back into our decision-making process. How do we go about doing that? Well, slime mold has proven itself in laboratory experiments to be remarkably good at solving some very difficult problems. Uh, Specifically, there have been experiments in which maps have been laid out in their petri dishes and oats put where the cities are. And if you see how the slime mold distributes itself over a period of days, you find that it perfectly emulates the highway system of the United States or England or wherever else. And so that 
has led some uh, scientists to flippantly say that slime molds would make very good civil engineers, and if there's a country out there that needs one, they can get it on the cheap. But, yeah, to me, that always seemed like it was really only the start of things and really only a basis for what slime molds potentially can do for us because slime molds are actually optimizing when they come up with those highway systems. And while we are pretty good at optimizing for our highways, we have our own civil engineers, we're not so good at optimizing for society as a whole, for figuring out how to address the problems of multiple parties, often in a state of political gridlock. And so the idea here is, can slime molds operate in a way as a think tank to advise us on how better to formulate our economic and political policies. All right. Oh, we need to back. First of all, I want to say uh, we have to be careful about what we say here because we start outsourcing jobs, American jobs, to slime mold that will work for less. Uh, we're going to get uh, in trouble with our current president. Uh, but uh, we have to back up, Megan. Uh, like slime mold is a two-word phrase which I am aware of. But when you get right down to it, I don't think I know what slime mold is. So sure. you better tell us. Sure. So slime mold or Physarum polycephalum, the species that we're working with, has historically been classified as a fungus, but we now know they're more closely related to the amoeba. And you can find it in your backyard. They grow in temperate and tropical forests in damp, shady areas. So if you go for a hike, turn over a log, you might find some yellow slimy goo and that's the slime mold. And it's there decomposing organic matter, dried leaves, bacteria, Whatever they can find, they can get a hold of. They they travel the forest floor in search of nutrients. And I'm about to reveal the depths of my ignorance, but my my primitive understanding of slime mold, Megan, is that it really is. It's like one big cell, right? It's like a whole bunch of flagell flagellating uh, cells that are kind of smashed together into one big thing. Well, close. They exist in several biological forms, so they can be in single cells. But a single cell takes a very long time to travel around and find nutrients, so those cells can fuse together to form massive superorganisms, which is the plasmodial form, um, which is what you're thinking of. And the, they still exist in their individual nuclei, so that the DNA is still separate, but they break down the cell walls, the cell membranes, and become one superorganism and, and are much more efficient at finding nutrients that way. And Megan, uh, before we get back to Jonathan, one thing we also n know, I guess, from some research is it does really appear that this organism can learn, right? It can, yes. One really cool experiment was if you shine light on slime mold in half-hour intervals, it starts to retract in anticipation of the next half-hour interval coming. So pretty crazy. Right. So, Jonathan, now basically what? The slime mold is kind of visiting faculty there at Hampshire College? That's right. So having observed what slime molds can do in the realm of civil engineering, the idea became could we give them some sort of basis for doing research to address other problems, ranging from, say, border policy, for instance, to um, legalization of marijuana, the, the, the issues that we seem unable to figure out on our own terms, or maybe issues even that are more close to them in terms of their their interests, uh, environmental regulation, for instance. And so Hampshire College agreed to host slime mold as visiting non-human scholars through the year 2019. And we have set up the Plasmodium Consortium as a think tank that can take on any sort of issue whatsoever, but especially those where we seem to be incapable as a species of coming to any sort of resolution and where our communications break down. And they have now had an entire year to be able to work out some potential solutions to problems by being presented with models that model human problems in terms that they are able to uh, process, and then by observing their behavior as a means by which to then dispatch advice to everyone from Jeff Sessions to Christian Nielsen to uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations. 
All right, so let's take one of these uh, cases in point. So uh, border policy, border security. Uh, so are the slime molds uh, saying build that wall? What are they saying to you, Jonathan? Well, the experiment was done, the investigation was done by taking as a premise something that I think is true in our society, but that we often don't recognize when we start to argue. And that is that every country has its own resources, has its own advantages, and also does not have all resources or all advantages. And so the question became, for slime mold, if you were to model that, would they thrive in circumstances that were constricted in terms of nation states or not? So slime molds need both carbohydrate and also they need um, protein in order to survive, or they need sugars and proteins in order to survive. And so what we did was to have proteins on one side of a border and carbohydrate on the other, and to then build a wall in one circumstance and not build a wall in the other condition, and to see what happened, to see whether, in fact, having that restriction, basically allowing the slime mold on either side to have all of the uh, protein, all of the sugar, whether that was beneficial or whether it was better for the slime mold to be able to effectively share resources. And what we found was not only that they were better off without that wall in terms of sharing resources, but that they thrived in particular right in the border zone, which led to the policy advice that we have conveyed by letter to the Department of Homeland Security that, in fact, a border wall should not be built. Instead, this is a place where there's a potential for enormous development, and we should build parkland instead. You know what I feel like you're describing to me? Alsace. I mean, if you think about it, France is proteins, Germany uh, is carbohydrates. Uh, you know, the territory has been passed back and forth, back and forth. Uh, there's mm-hmm. something very Alsatian about this experiment. So, Megan, is there a particular, besides that one, is there a particular problem that your slime mold has been working on that you're uh, especially excited about? I'm really excited about one student's project who is studying the the local bus system. So our local bus system has been thinking about um, how to cut costs, and they have been proposing route cuts. And so our students have been um, taking a map of western Massachusetts and putting oats where there are the major stops and watching slime mold as it creates an efficient network between them. And then what happens when you, when you cut out some of those routes or can we add some routes in different places to make a more thriving network? And I think that I'm, I'm excited about this because it's a local problem. It's a, it's a real issue. Our students are collaborating with networks in the area to do their research and really think about which stops are important. And this is something that's happening now, and it, it's part of a current conversation. So I'm really excited about that one. And, Megan, this is something that Slime Mold is kind of, quote, good, unquote, at, right? I mean, didn't they uh, lay out a, a subway system for Tokyo or something like that? Right, exactly. So what they do is they search their entire environment for where the nutrients are, and then they reinforce the connections between them while avoiding repellents. And so they can perfectly replicate the U.S. highway system or make suggestions for the Tokyo subway system that might be more efficient than what human engineers have created. Um, Megan, one of the things that sort of comes up these days, particularly as sort of a a conservative critique, is uh, uh, that these are scripted answers. Um, (laughs) So how do you make sure that the the slime mold isn't just telling you what you want to hear? Sure. Well, this is a collaboration as I've been looking at it. And so there's certainly human bias in the design of the experiments and the interpretation of the results. But Slime Mold doesn't care about politics. And so we're hoping to be inspired by their economical decision making when we watch their actions in a Petri dish. And some of the the results might be obvious. Of course, an open border is going to be more beneficial for their, their thriving. Um, but maybe people will be more likely to listen if there's if there's perceived human bias taken out of it. If we're if we're watching an organism that assesses its environment with inputs and then delivers an output, and it, it's something more understandable. We're we're simplifying a system and. Slime mold also acts for the good of the whole, and that's what, what we're hoping to convince policymakers to pay attention to. 
You know, Jonathan Keats, you said that the uh, border security uh, suggestions by the slime mold, you, you you submitted those to the Department of Homeland Security, where I assume they were added to your already burgeoning file. Um, but I'm also wondering, uh, this seems bigger, bigger than the United States, right? I mean, it seems to me that slime mold should be talking to, to United Nations commissions and, and those kinds of things. Are there ways to get them, uh, the slime molds, into international debates? Well, these letters have been copied to officials at the intergovernmental level, including the United Nations. But I think that ultimately, indeed, we do want the slime molds to be able to uh, establish offices in government and also in these sort of multinational institutions. And we've already developed a mobile research unit that provides any institution that wants it with the materials and also with the know-how to be able to model whatever problems they confront and to have slime molds engage those problems. So that's one level at which this is operating. I think that another level at which it's operating is that in the process of encountering these processes, these problems, this way of operating, that we come to observe how a superorganism, an organism that is comprised of many organisms all working in concert for their mutual benefit, how that superorganism addresses our problems. And I think that we are a superorganism as well. This is, I think, somewhat recent as a phenomenon within, um, within evolutionary history. That is to say that we are now capable as never before, by now I mean in the last several hundred years, of affecting all of the planet, even just a few of us in terms of our actions. And also we are incredibly highly networked, ever more so as an as a entire world system. So it seems to me that by finding our inner slime mold, so to speak, our mm. inner superorganism, that we can potentially behave in a way that is more in concert with what and who we are now, and that really the most important part of this might ultimately be as important as it is to include slime mold in discussion and in debate, and perhaps even to award the slime mold the Nobel Peace Prize at some stage. But what is most important, perhaps, is to try to internalize alternate ways of thinking, a way of thinking that we can discover by observing the slime mold that can potentially get us out of the current us versus them tribalism that seems to be destroying so much of our society. You know, Megan, uh, you know, people might be saying, well, why pay any attention to what slime mold has to say about anything? And uh, part of your answer, I think, is slime mold has been around for a billion years. You know, they they've, they have much more longevity and experience than we do. It's proven that their way of life essentially works, right? And and I guess to Jonathan's point, part of that is the, the collectivism. There are, to continue with our Star Trek metaphors, they're like the Borg, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, any, any part of them is basically seven of nine or maybe be seven of nine million. Right. Yes, they're they're very adaptive, and so um, one of the reasons that we were initially interested in using slime mold was um, the idea of climate change, and maybe slime mold can give us some answers because humans are not doing a very good job, and so the that longevity is it, it's an it's an environmental intelligence that we should really be tapping into. All right. We have to stop there, but uh, we will, of course, be uh, in touch with the slime mold. We've got uh, more time ahead of us uh, for this consortium. We do want to thank very much Megan Dobro and Jonathan Keats. Now we're going to take a break. We're going to come back and talk about ways in which slime, if not slime mold, have become almost insanely, and I don't even use that term lightly, popular on the Internet. The three greatest moments in slime, Dr. Peter Venkman and Ghostbusters, all the Nickelodeon game shows, and the Scaramucci era. Today's show was slimed by Josh Nalea and me, Kion Wolf. Amanda Fish is not unslimy. The part of Bill Curry was played by Demi Lovato. Tomorrow, revisit our show about obituaries at 1 p.m. and then enjoy a live Oscar show at 8 p.m. And now, back to Colin. 
I want to mention that uh, you could go up on Friday to Hampshire College. I'm sure there's stuff on the website. There will be a symposium with the slime mold. I mean, if you want to like get to know the slime mold better, know more about it and stuff like that, March 2nd. We are going to talk a little bit about sort of a different aspect of slime. Uh, that is uh, uh, an internet craze, which I must confess I was unaware of, but which has resulted in videos to get like 22 million viewings. Here to explain it all, all to us is, is Emma Sagner, uh, administrative assistant and freelance journalist at NPR. Welcome to our show. Hi, Colin. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, this is, uh, well, actually, maybe the first thing we should do is give people a little sense of the sound of slime. So this is what you would hear if you were to hear slime being kind of hand kneaded on one of these videos. So, Emma, we've got uh, hundreds of thousands of YouTube videos, Instagram, Facebook, uh, uh, Etsy posts. We've got um, a, a phenomenon so pervasive uh, that uh, Elmer's glue is, if not facing shortages, having to up its production by about 50 percent just to keep up with the, the need for Elmer's glue as an ingredient to this homemade DIY slime. What's going on here? What, what is this? What's happening? Well, I think there's a couple things happening here. Uh, on the one hand, slime is fun to play with. It's satisfying. It's tactile, so kids love it. Kids love making it. They can put different ingredients and colors in it. And then on the other hand, there is this other aspect of it that this sort of weirdly satisfying trend that's happening on the Internet where you see people cutting up slime or playing with slime, and those videos are being used uh, in a lot of times, they're being used to help people trigger ASMR, which is this new phenomenon that adults seem to be experiencing where they have a physical reaction to sounds or visual triggers. Right. This is sometimes called an orgasm of the head. Uh, it's like <laughs> a, 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 something you might experience in your scalp uh, that's noise triggered. And at least for some portion of the population, it's pleasurable. Um, yeah. So people are seeking this this experience out. They can apparently get it by the n noise that's being made by this substance. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. So, but meanwhile, there. I mean, we have to talk about Karina Garcia. Karina Garcia, a aka the Slime Queen. I've been watching her videos today. I mean, she really does have like I think at least twenty-two million people watching one video where she's making I think a hundred pounds of slime and creating a stress ball out of it. I mean, but I mean, any kind of slime she makes, people want to watch this. And it's not just the noise, right? There's this sense that there's something else people are seeking, and, and they're not only seeking it, they're buying it on Etsy. Yeah, totally. So that is Karina Garcia, as you mentioned, she's the queen of slime. I believe that she is the real originator of the viralness that's happening right now with slime. Although a lot of people did it on the internet, she was the first one getting millions of views on her slime videos. And to me, I think it's because She's so whimsical with it. I mean, she, you know, you mentioned this 100-pound stress ball that she made. I think she made a bunch of edible slimes, like a Starburst edible slime and a Flaming Hot Cheeto slime. So I think people really like it, her videos, for the whimsy of it. Right. There, there, there's something about that. And then I, I think there's something, I mean, I think the... The market and the audience for this mostly is pretty young people, and we also have very young people making this stuff, selling it on Etsy, and in some cases, well, I mean, in Karina's sense, I think she's now selling advertising on her videos and making a lot of money. I mean, I think she is like a millionaire at this point. She's 23 years old or so. Uh, but, I mean, kids are selling slime on Etsy, and I wonder what the, what else that is. Like, it must connect us psychologically to some you know, part of ourselves that we have trouble getting in touch with or, or just something that a kid really wants? Do, or do kids, I'm babbling here, do kids just want really icky things? I don't think it's that it's icky. I think, I mean, if you've played with slime, you know that it can be a little icky. Uh, you don't want to get it on anything cotton. It will ruin it. But if you keep it on a table and you've got a clean area, it can be pretty clean to play with. You can walk away with clean hands. Um, and there are even videos online of people using slime to pick up dust in their car, like as a duster or something. So it's multi-purpose. But yeah, I think that the kids love it because it's 
tactile and that's really fun and it's a different texture than anything that you feel in regular life it's kind of like sticking your hands in a bowl of jello so sometimes we say don't try this at home we're not saying don't try this at home about making slime but don't try it at home if you don't know what you're doing because one of the ingredients one of the key ingredients in most of this diy slime is borax and emma i gather that really can be a little bit dangerous if you don't handle it right yeah definitely there definitely have been some reports of kids getting hurt by using powder borax and not really understanding that it is a chemical and it's not a toy. Um, And that's actually been a huge part of Elmer's push to get into this slime business. They realized quickly that they were essential to this, and they started making content on their website about it. And one of the big things that they've done that's different from other uh, websites or individuals that are making content about slime is they are obviously focused on kids because they mostly make craft supplies. So they are focused on putting out recipes that are non-borax. And there actually are lots of recipes that you can make slime without borax. Um, I'm also wondering, you know, just in terms of that notion of, I mean, we've got Karina and her 100-pound stress ball, but there is, uh, I, I, is it possible that just in a very, very stressful environment, I mean, life in 2018 feels more stressful maybe than it's ever been, that people just want something that's kind of inert and they could just mess around with with their fingers? Totally. I think so. I'm that kind of person. I love playing with squishy things and just having a a little something to fidget with. I think people really like that. And I I mean, apparently they like it to the point that they're willing to buy something that you could make at home off of Etsy from a kid. So... And, and, you know, in our remaining moments, we should just uh, return momentarily anyway to, to ASMR. Uh, as we say, this is this uh, n- sound-triggered reaction that people uh, have. It may actually be, finally, at last, a, a harmless pleasure, something that you can actually <laughs> really enjoy at a, at a pretty uh, elevated level uh, that doesn't involve any kind of forbidden substances. Uh, but, Emma, also, it's a thing that really is just starting to be studied. Yeah, so when I wrote my article, which was back in October, there had only been one academic study that was done on ASMR, and it was really sort of the most basic study that you can do, which was just taking what people have found on the Internet, putting it into a clinical study, and saying, yes, they're right, this is a physical experience that people are having, and they are triggered by different kinds of things. Right. And so it, it, and for some people, it's almost like a, a trance state that they go into, right? Exactly. Yeah. So once again, I mean, you have people who are stressed, uh, people who are looking for a way out of the stress. uh, So they don't want to do opioids. They don't want to do, you know, other kinds of addictive substances. I mean, until somebody finds out that there's something really, really wrong with this or that people have car accidents while they're experiencing it or something like that. ASMR, that could be kind of the horizon uh, that we, we need to fix our gaze on. Definitely. I think so. And I mean, to me, the cool thing about it is that, yes, slime is a part of it, but the range of things that trigger different people is so wide. It ranges from slime videos to videos of Bob Ross painting to someone whispering into a microphone to just watching someone eat. It's all kinds of things. So there's really something for everybody. All right. Well, I just want to say from on a personal basis that... um, Bob Ross will never cause me to have an orgasm of my head. But, you know, everybody's wired a little bit differently, right, Emma? Absolutely. All right. So we want to thank uh, you very much for talking to us. This is uh, Emma Sagner, uh, administrative assistant and freelance journalist at NPR, who has reported on the slime phenomenon. Uh, I got uh, a little bit of uh, a few extra seconds here. So let me quickly thank everybody who had anything to do with this show, uh, including uh, Josh Nalea, who came up with this idea. We have a longstanding uh, sort of collaboration with Jonathan Keats. We've probably done more shows with Jonathan Keats because of Jonathan Keats' ideas than and any other human being who has anything to do uh, with us. Uh, and it's been a very a fruitful one. I sort of feel like we are the show that gets Jonathan Keats, although increasingly other people are starting to get him as well. So I do want to mention once again, March 2nd, which I'm fairly sure is Friday, is when there will be the consortium up at Hampshire College where you can go up there and hang out with the slime mold and maybe ask it to solve specific world problems that are important to you. Uh, and anyway, we'll be back with more shows. We're, we have kind of a crazy 
couple of days ahead of us. We'll be back with an older show about obits tomorrow, and then we're live on Thursday night. Just remember that. Live at 8 p.m. on Thursday night with a special edition of The Nose, kind of an Oscar party hosted by Vivian Nabetta. I mean, I'll be here too, but it's sort of Vivian's gig. Well, I am the time from the day.